Hi all, before we begin, two quick announcements. First, if you haven't yet filled out the Unchained survey, please give us your thoughts on how Unchained is doing and what it could do better. Two lucky survey respondents will receive a BTC candle, which is scented with Satoshi Wood, Musk Musk, Tulip Bulbs, and Finite Minerals. Head to surveymonkey.com slash r slash unchained 2021 to fill out the survey today. Again, that's surveymonkey.com slash r slash unchained 2021. Second, as I mentioned earlier, I am now writing a blog on Medium. This week, I have a little post on my interview with today's guest, and that's because she's an artist. And so what better way to compliment the show than to showcase some of her art? Head to medium.com slash at Laura Shin to check out the post and to see the art that we discuss in today's fascinating interview. Again, the URL is medium.com slash at Laura Shin, and be sure to follow me there. And now on to the show. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Unchained, your no-hype resource for all things crypto. I'm your host, Laura Shin, a journalist with over two decades of experience. I started covering crypto six years ago, and as a senior editor at Forbes, was the first mainstream media reporter to cover cryptocurrency full-time. This is the September 21st, 2021 episode of Unchained. Looking for crypto market data that meets institutional standards? Digital Asset Research delivers curated and vetted crypto market data. Get crypto pricing and verified volume data, crypto asset reference data, and token and blockchain event tracking. Learn more at digitalassetresearch.com. Ledger is the secure gateway to buy, exchange, and grow your crypto. No need to use different platforms to manage and secure your crypto. You have one place for all your crypto needs. Visit ledger.com and make your crypto journey easier and safer. The Crypto.com app lets you buy, earn, and spend crypto all in one place. Earn up to 8.5% interest on your Bitcoin and 14% interest on your stablecoins, paid weekly. Download the Crypto.com app and get $25 with the code LAURA. The link is in the description. Today's guest is Rhea Myers, artist, hacker, and writer, and senior smart contract developer at Dapper Labs. Welcome, Rhea. So listeners of the episode with People Pleaser will remember that it originally featured two guests, but one guest's audio and video files were lost in the ether. And that person was Rhea, and I'm so glad to have her back now because Rhea is a true OG crypto artist who was making blockchain-based art even before NFTs really existed, which is um, kind of hard to do <laughs> as far as I can tell. Uh, so anyway, so Bria, why don't you get started by telling us what it is that you used to do before crypto, how you got into it and how you got into crypto art and NFTs and also a little bit about what you do now. Sure. So I went to art school um, a very long time ago and I did digital art and I just sort of I decided that sort of rather than have a, a struggling career as an artist with um, most of my time spent making the money to support my art, I would have a struggling career in software development and take the money from that and use it to make art. So I sort of worked in industry. I, I kept making art, not least because making art is how I learn about things. It's how I understand the world. And um, I sort of just kept making sort of different kinds of art using computers. There, there's a, um, a famous essay about techno-utopianism called The Californian Ideology by Richard Brabrook and Andy Cameron. And I joke that I sort of took that as a manifesto. It, it's not, it's a critique, but I've sort of accidentally ended up tracking each development in technology and, and what goes with it and making art out of it. So I, I have sort of generative art bots on Tumblr that are still cranking out several drawings a day. I, I did some experiments with AI art like everyone else a couple of years ago and decided that it probably wasn't going to be a major direction for me, which is a shame because I've been looking forward to doing something like that since I was a kid. And then um, when I sort of moved to Canada eight years ago because I met a nice Canadian and she married me and imported me. Um, I was unable to work for a few months because we were sorting out my permanent residency and I was just staying here as a guest. And I was walking around Vancouver a lot 
um, looking at the sort of changing city skyline and going to all the crypto meetups because that was a new thing. Nobody really knew each other there. So as a new arrival, I was just sort of, you know, one of the many new people at this thing. And I got to see sort of, you know, the fire in people's eyes as they talked about this world changing technology. And I got to see something else in sort of some people around the edge of the room's eyes as they sort of saw this way to make exciting new businesses and maybe extract some money from the other people and i was struck by this because i'd seen this before i'd seen this in the um, internet scene and the net art scene in the uk in the 90s and so i I sort of dug into it and i I learned um, about the technology and as i say the way i learn and understand things is through making art so i started making art about it i crafted some bitcoin transactions as art that's something you can do if you're an artist um just get to do something and declare it art which is very useful to be able to do because if it goes wrong you get to say hey it's part of the artwork this is great (laughs) which is just as well because i i forgot about change transactions during my first bitcoin transaction and sent all of the money that i didn't send to to the transaction i made to a miner so Oh. Some, some miner somewhere got a load of Bitcoin from me. So that was a good learning experience and a good art experience. So um, yeah, I started out with Bitcoin transactions, moved on to Doge Party, which is the long forgotten fork of the counterparty system, which works on top of Dogecoin rather than Bitcoin. Um, and then when Ethereum was starting to be proposed as a thing. I was just I was just ready for it. I'd, I'd sort of done some work on other systems. I'd really dug into the ideas around it. Um, I was enjoying playing with the limitations of the systems, and I saw Ethereum. It was like my, my original pitch to myself was it's Bitcoin with loops. You, you can do all the Cody stuff you can do on Bitcoin, but you can sort of add log- more logic to it and, and sort of do interesting things with that. So, yeah, I, I 2014, I was making Doge Party tokens, counterparty tokens, sending Bitcoin transactions, starting to look at how Ethereum could be used for art making for, and not just for artworks, but for sort of commissioning art, for critiquing art, for exhibiting art. And um, around that time, or possibly just slightly before, Margaret, uh, coin artist from Blockade Games sort of popped up like you know the character in a a secret agent movie who comes along and says hey i've got a mission for you would you would you like to do this and and sort of she was doing these amazing um what's at the time called um alternate reality games although they're now crypto puzzle trails and i'd seen the first one she'd done and not really understood it but then realized there was something there and worked very hard on understanding it and yeah I, i helped marguerite out on sort of the the sort of the, the actual cryptographic element of some of the puzzle trails she'd say you know i want to do this can we do this um i know these algorithms is there anything slightly different and that sort of culminated in the painting she made called torched hearts which is the one of the doves and the flames and the chessboard and all the flames around the edge and um yeah we, we came up with what we thought was a more difficult puzzle for that than the ones that we had been doing previously because people had cracked those very quickly because a community had sprung up around them and so we thought let's give them a bit more of a challenge we came up with i think it was a six bit encoding for the flames i handed marguerite this this written little you know code generated list of sort of tall flame orange red outline curved left and that kind of thing and she painted 160 of those with perfect accuracy at the feet that I'm still in awe of. And we released it, the community descended upon it, and then nothing really moved forward for about two years. So the $2,000 worth of Bitcoin that Marguerite had put in the uh, Bitcoin wallet that the flames represented the private key of went up in value during this time to i think uh, about forty thousand us dollars by the time someone solved it which which left me being very nervous about having the private key on my laptop when i was going to meet up so i had to sort of move that off but um yeah that that was sort of where things really really took hold on my imagination and i, I just sort of kept working through the, the, I guess, the, the 
project, the program I came up with when I first looked at Ethereum. And as a result of that, I've been working on Ethereum since before the initial release. Uh, I've been working on it since the testnet. And so when Marguerite was doing a games company, I eventually said yes to joining up and working on the smart contracts for that. Um, that was Blockade Games, and that was brilliant. And then after doing that, um, after the first round of smart contract development was done, I moved to Dapper Labs in Vancouver. It's my first time working for a Canadian company in Canada, and they're lovely. Um, they they make these little things, although I should be very clear, so I'm not here to represent the company. I'm here in the personal capacity. Um, and when I'm there, I work on the Cadence programming language, which is a really awesome smart programming language. A smart contract program language. And it's sort of like Flow's version of Solidity? Um, yeah, it's, it's sort of, it, it is to Flow as, as Solidity is to Ethereum. It's a very, very different kind of programming language, very deliberately so. Um, I, I certainly first encountered Dapper Labs as the people who broke the Ethereum blockchain by um, causing so many transactions by people um, buying and breeding crypto kitties at the Ethereum mm -hmm. network just couldn't cope with, with the strain. So sort of Dapper took their experience from that and, and sort of created Flow to be more, more scalable in, for that kind of scenario and to make it more scalable and more robust, took everything that they'd learned from using Solidity and yeah, made, made cadence with that. Um, I, I was quite sad to be stopping working on Solidity full time because I felt that it was just about getting to the point where um, it was nicely robust for the things I wanted to do and I wasn't having to sort of check what had changed or which bugs had been fixed on each version. Um, and yes, yeah, so now here I'm working working on Cadence. But yeah, it's it's a really, really good programming language in my personal opinion. And in my professional opinion, it's it's perfect for flow. So yay, Cadence. One thing I will say is that um, I had some of my real life friends who are not into crypto read my book. And hilariously, one of them um, even though CryptoKitties is not like a major plot point, it's definitely mentioned, obviously, because, you know, it's a huge um, <laughs> event in Ethereum's history. Um, but even though it doesn't go super in depth into that, when I asked her her thoughts in the book, like one of the things she just had to say was like, oh my God, that CryptoKitties thing, like, I think that's so crazy. Like, why were people, and she just like didn't get it. Even now, she she still doesn't understand NFTs. But anyway, um, so I actually want to go back to some of the Bitcoin art. Like, so what did you have to do? Like, what, what were those art pieces? I'm so curious. So um, th th there are various different traditions of art in what I will shorthand as Western or international art. Art historians can sort of take me out and rough me up later for phrasing it in these terms. I'm, I'm just shorthanding this. So one of the art movements that really interests me is from the 1960s and 70s in uh, America, Europe, and elsewhere, and that's conceptual art. And conceptual art was a reaction to a very specific set of historical circumstances in the art world at that time. You had the first generation of artists who had been professionally trained in anything resembling a sort of art degree type art school setting. Um, you had the sort of absolutely iron grip of um, Greenbergian modernist um, art criticism. Um, for those of you who don't know, there's this sort of one art critic who, who had amazing power over the imagination of um, what people thought art could do, even if he didn't have the sort of actual power to, to make and break artists so much at that point. I and think his first name was, was it Saul Greenberg? Oh, oh no, sorry, it's, it's Clement Greenberg. Clement, so, great, that's right. Yes, yes, right. yeah, yeah. Um, it's an interesting name. You know, there was this entrenched system of art exhibition, of art review, of art promotion, which if you're an upcoming young, young artist, firstly, didn't have access to. And secondly, it just looked sort of really boring and sort of not very much to do with the art. So various different artists decided they weren't going to have anything to do with that. And they, they just sort of, they didn't know what to do instead of it. So they just carried on. And over time, sort of the conversations became the art or different mathematical propositions became the art 
or um, sort of, you know, proposing to do things that they couldn't actually afford to do because they weren't part of the gallery system became the art. And this this was sort of very interesting because whilst artists have always sort of proposed artworks or sketched out artworks or something, there's always been this sort of final stage of, of a patron or the market saying, okay, I will give you the cash to do this. And conceptual art just short-circuited that it took that out of the loop. Artists could sort of do their thing and, and the art world didn't say, no, you can't do that. I'm not going to give you money for it. Now, um, the art world and capitalism in general likes nothing so much as something that it can't buy. So very quickly, conceptual art became recuperated by the art world and you will now find very, very, very stylish, enormous great big text installations in galleries and sort of very carefully preserved little bits of computer printout from 1967, which are now worth tens of thousands of dollars, whereas at the time the artists making it were basically parodying um, you know what people were doing with art at the time. But for me, the, the interesting thing was this encounter between art and commerce, this encounter between art and network technology at that time. Uh, people were sort of, you know, using cheap jets travel to get around. They were using long distance phone calls. They were using video systems, teletypes, the old um, the text printing network. And the way artists made use both of the possibilities and limitations there just struck me as a very useful precedent for how I thought um, blockchain art could go. So this was useful for me because um, I could say to, to the art world imagined audience that I was addressing, it's okay, you know this, it isn't a weird new technology that you should immediately hate and be scared of, it's fertile territory for making conceptual art. It's good resources for including in conceptual art type works. And, and the, other, the other precedent, uh, which I mentioned earlier, was um, the net art of the 90s and 2000s, which in a very similar scenario to conceptual art, you had artists who were either embedded in universities, which had internet access to a higher degree than the rest of society, particularly in Europe, or you had people who were working as web designers or, or on e-commerce projects and who had access not just to the technology, but to um, amazing though it may seem to anyone doing web design now, the capital and free time to sort of be a web designer half the month and an artist the other half of the month. And net artists were very much um, sort of going into or onto network spaces and sort of critiquing them, not, not in a, oh, this is terrible sort of way, but in a, let's look around, let's see what's going on, let's think about this, let's reflect on it and see what's going on here rather than just simply being swept along by it and sort of calling this art rather than political intervention or, or anything else. As I said, it allows you to get away with things that you couldn't otherwise. It, it, it sort of people will take you less seriously, which allows you to do things which they will then think about more seriously. It's it's sort of a really useful effect. So with the Bitcoin transactions, I was learning how to construct Bitcoin transactions. I was bringing in this this history of conceptual art and of um, of net art, and I was just sort of trying to demonstrate to myself and to others that there was there was something here for art. And so I started out with um, a self portrait because if, it's sort of if if you take people. Um, around gallery um, who are not sort of totally, totally brainwashed by the art world, then they're generally very interested in recognisable imagery like like portraits, and, and that's perfectly cool. And so, um, yeah, I put a portrait of myself on the blockchain, which is actually um, the the cryptographic hash of my 23andMe genome. So I can absolutely prove that someone with the same genetics as me has existed since sometime in early 2014. So it's a sort of proof of existence kind of thing. And and if you're familiar with the idea of proof of existence from that time, you can see we're already playing with the, the concepts and probably getting away with it. Sorry. You yeah. And say. by the way, um, so when I was doing research for this show, I just kept texting my assistant and like laughing because like <laughs> this, this one, by the way, for people um, who don't know, this piece of art is called my soul. <laughs> um, and so I was just like laughing and it's on Dogecoin or, or, or what, what was it? it was, well, you put on Dogecoin and Bitcoin or something yeah. or counterparty yeah. or I forget what the... 
So my, my soul is actually a later one. So th th this is like a pure oh. Bitcoin transaction with the hash margin. My soul, it was, it was um, in, in, in philosophical terms, it's a bare assertion. So th there were um, some of my favorite, um, shall I say, legacy artists, Petro Dollar Art World. Some of my favorite fiat art world artists were a couple of Soviet expats called Komar and Melamid. I can't remember their first names. Sorry, guys who were working in the US in the 80s and 90s, and they were very into um, sort of parodying democratic pretensions so that they would commission like phone survey companies at the time who would call people up, say, what's, you know, what do you like in arts? And they'd get 100 people to say, they'd then paint that, invite the people to the show, and they'd be horrified that, that they'd got nothing that they actually wanted. So another thing that they did was they would buy artists' souls. So they'd give the artists like 100 bucks, get them to sign a thing, signing over their soul to them. I think they managed to get Andy Warhol's soul at one point. <laughs> so um, I thought, well, I can do better than that. I can cryptographically secure this, and I can fractionalize it, and this will be worth much more so i originally um issued yeah 100 tokens of it on the doge party um, system which is um, a fork of the counterparty system on bitcoin but on dogecoin um that sort of didn't really go anywhere as a platform um so you know so much for um the blockchain as a permanent record the data is there but until someone resurrects that system, hopefully as an art project, um, it's not going to be very easily accessible. So I moved that to Counterparty and um, sort of, you know, people looked at it with, with benign amusement and confusion. And it wasn't until a couple of years later, you'll notice a trend here, things sort of go out into the world and it takes a few years for people to really, really, really st um, get through them. Yeah, a couple of years later, people started saying, hey, can I buy part of your soul? And I, I said, sure, let me just look into it. And I was talking to my wife about this, and she was not unreasonably terribly offended by the idea of anyone other than herself owning my soul. So <laughs> I'm, I'm actually not allowed to, I'm not allowed to sell these tokens so they're, they're just sitting there and sort of people have said you know can you make a proxy token for this and we'll buy that instead and I was like, no it's still you know too much of my soul for the love <laughs> of my life to be comfortable with me giving away and i think you can understand that and everyone does understand that when i say it so that's good that's i find that hilarious because it is true that um I, I think I texted him like, oh, I'd love to buy one of these. Um, so <laughs> good to know in advance that, um, you know, off limits. All right. Well, why don't we talk about one other, um, one other, one of your pieces, which is the one that you auctioned off at Sotheby's earlier this year. Tell us about that artwork. And I love the title. Uh, it's called Secret Artwork and then in parentheses, Content and um, so tell us about that artwork and then also what it was like to have your work auctioned off at Sotheby's. Yes. Yeah, you, you can tell it's very serious modern art if it has something in parentheses in it. If, if you if you put untitled in the parentheses, that, that you know, that's it. You can still go home. Anyway, um, so, yeah, I, I mentioned earlier conceptual art. One of my favorite conceptual arts, um, not artists, but groups of artists, is a very grumpy Marxist um, outfit called Art and Language, who were formed in London, not London, sorry, in, in, in England and America in the 60s and sort of whittled down to sort of a couple of core members who are still going. And uh, one of their early pieces was engaging with the certificates of authenticity that people um, people make to say, no, you know, this small crumpled piece of paper with some gravy stains on it is actually an artwork by me. Um, so these kinds of certificates were, were very big at the time. Um, guarantees on artworks, you know, that, that sort of like guarantee that this is actually an artwork by me were very closely related and so art and language sort of took this ran with it and made a perfectly black painting with a little certificate by it saying that the content of this artwork is secret and known only to the <laughs> artist and um you know you sort of 
this, this is great fun. It's a fun concept. It's novel, and it sort of pokes gentle fun at um, the, the structures that had grown up to make this often deliberately unownable art very, very, very ownable and sellable and exhibitable. So um, the reason I dug into this particular bar- part of my toolbox was a uh, a nice curator and other kind of activity person called Sam Hart was curating a show in the San Francisco, the old San Francisco Mint, um, and it was on. And they had a co-curator who I will go to hell for forgetting the name of. Sorry about that. Um, but anyway, Sam was my contact. So sorry about that. And um, that they they were curating a show and they said would you like to see it's on the theme of secrets would you like to do something so i thought oh yeah i'm I'm looking at zk snarks at the moment we could do something with that that'd be that'd be fun and i I looked at the code libraries and the explains for zk snarks at the time and my my reaction was i'm I'm an art student i can't understand any of this I, i don't know what's going on here this is less spooky moon math and more math from another dimension where things just work differently um and the sort of the toolkits were were there but very rough and ready at the time so i I had to go back to sam and say oh yeah i'm not going to be able to do this like that let's just do what we always do and do a, a cryptographic hash and do something with that so rather than a a nice blank canvas with a certificate next to it i sort of came up with something that would be interesting to go in an artwork um created the cryptographic hash of the text of that um saved the original text somewhere in in a bank vault or or a cave in the top of a mountain or somewhere that people will not be able to access having learned the lesson about not keeping things on my laptop um i personally genuinely cannot remember what it was now but i I can access it if i'm ever taken to court to prove that i i i did have an idea so yeah we took the cryptographic hash of that that's secure until someone breaks SHA-256, and then that's sort of placed on the blockchain with the token um, as some data associated with it. And then there's um, a nice web front end, uh, front end so like it's a DAP. Uh, the front end tells you absolutely everything it can about the token. Um, it just scrolls it up the screen, like watching a block explore, showing new transactions coming in. So it tells you when the contract was created the address of the contract it tells you the transaction that created the token the number of the token the cryptographic hash contained in the token the transaction that created the token the block that created the token the time of it it tells you all of these irrelevant details it tells you them in written text it tells you them in numbers in shapes in colors in musical notes is one of my favorites and you need to make sure emoji yes you have to make sure that you've got a a good solid Unicode font installed on your on your uh, device that's showing it. So it tells you absolutely everything in every way it can as this grand distraction from the one thing you want to know, which is the thing promised in its title, which is the actual content of this notional artwork. And f- for me, this 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 is a nice. I'm going to use the word allegory in an artistic context, which will get me taken to art jail, but it's a nice parallel, I guess. It's a nice parallel to the experience of public key cryptography. You have these two guarantees with public key cryptography. You have one of absolute secrecy. You know, No one will be able to, to guess what has been encrypted with your public key. And you have this other guarantee of absolute identity. Nobody else can forge a signature that you have made with your private key. So you have this interplay of knowing absolutely everything about someone um, via their their cryptographic um, key, via via their, their public key cryptography system. And yes, at the same time, there's just something hiding behind it and sort of as, as i went on with this with this project you know that really became um for me very much what it was about because I, I i make art when it doesn't leave me alone sort of the idea comes to me and i can't get rid of it and after a while i go okay i'm going to make you i'm not going to think about you too much i'll work out what you are about afterwards uh, and to be clear i'm just sat there with a lightning bolt hitting me i'll be sort of reading lots and lots of crypto 
theory and looking at lots and lots of art and my subconscious will be churning away in the background and yeah so yeah this one came to be very much about the sort of dialectic between absolute identity and absolute secrecy in public key cryptography and sort of you know it, it's as with much of the art that i've made about crypto so it's a nice way into thinking about those ideas um if you are unfamiliar with public key cryptography and we're certainly not born naturally knowing how RSA or ECC works, um, this experience of being able to provably see everything about something but not quite knowing what's behind it is a useful way to start thinking about those ideas. And it, it looks fun when you project it or show it on the screen in the gallery. Um, it's got some movement in it, which is always good for drawing the eye. So I, I made this for the show. It was exhibited in the show. It was projected on the lovely solid metal walls of the vault of the old San Francisco Mint, which was absolutely delightful for a crypto artwork. And um, as is a common thread in these stories, I then forgot about it for a couple of years until the Sotheby's auction was being organised and we were talking about you know what I had, which was sort of both very early on and could be easily sold because uh, a lot of my early work I very, very deliberately made unsaleable um, due to sort of art world hangovers about money being bad uh, and also to, to sort of critique the, the currency basis for, for um, blockchain and sort of obviously cryptocurrency. So sort of we went back and sort of tried to work out whether we could resurrect any of the Doge Party pieces other than myself and whether sort of we'd have to try and sort of cross-chain transfer them to Ethereum or something because, um, you know, Ethereum was very much where they wanted the, the work to be. I couldn't transfer it to Flow for various reasons. And so um, the work that sort of came up as the one which was sort of the insection of early and saleable on the Ethereum blockchain was was secret artwork. And the experience of selling it was absolutely amazing. So without wishing to sound like someone from the awards show, <laughs> the money was nice. I'm not going to lie. Um, I, 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 I sort of, you know, I, I had a tax bill to pay from last year and then the money will help with that. But... Um, the, the thing that was absolutely amazing was talking to people who had read um, Artists Rethinking the Blockchain, the book that Furtherfield did that I had some essays in, who had you know, looked at art and sort of got, you know, they, they, they'd sort of got what some of the early crypto artists, blockchain artists were doing and sort of having the, the fiat art world institutional power of something like Sotheby's going, oh, yes, there is something of interest to this work. Let us write it up in a way which is understandable by the, the um, auction going art world public it was absolutely amazing. Um, like, it, you know, it, it's sort of very sad to be yet another art world rebel who has gone, hey, you can't buy my work. It's it's on this blockchain thing that you don't understand or you're used to. Oh, the validation from this hundreds of years old institution is absolutely wonderful. Oh, wow. Like, you know, I, I totally know that I, I am sort of, I guess, selling out there, but I'm, I'm deeply relaxed with selling out, so that's <laughs> fine. But um, yeah, so that, you know, the, the the institutional attention, the the um, the art historical attention they gave to it was was amazing, and then the sale went up, and sort of everyone else's work went up to millions and millions of dollars, and mine was sort of hovering around, I think about six thousand um, dollars the night before the sale finished, and I was really happy because so I'd set up a little display which is refreshing and showing the price of my my work to sort of make sure that number go up and it, yeah, it was it was at like six it was at five thousand six thousand or something that's great this is more than i've ever sold my artwork for before i'm so happy i woke up and looked at the screen and i thought oh no it's gone down because i hadn't realized there was an extra zero at the end so it'd gone up from like it'd gone up tenfold o overnight and like that, that that was just amazing i was really you know sort of going from not just being the hypocrite about, hey, I, I don't need um, art world validation 
to, uh, to oh, I'm so grateful for this validation, to I'm making this resolutely non-commercial work. I don't need your money, to, hey, I've sold this for lots of money. That's amazing. So, um, yeah, it was it was just – and the, the thing that uh, – to get back to my, my awards show speech – the, the the critical attention that it got that that got me was amazing because having been not quite shouting into the void um, for how long was it since twenty fourteen like artists rethinking the blockchain was published in twenty seventeen I th- I thought oh this is great you know it's a book about blockchain art oh, there'll be dozens of these in two years time and this will be a fun historical time capsule there's still to my knowledge no other um, Phrasing this delicately, sort of art worldy books on, on blockchain art. There are plenty of guides to making your own NFTs, and then I'm not talking about those, but sort of actual factual sitting art world people down and saying, hey, what's this blockchain thing? Or sitting now crypto artists down saying, hey, what's this art world thing? Doesn't seem to have taken off in the way that, you know, I was, I was hoping it would. So, sort of people seeing the Sotheby's auction and looking at you know, the write-up and then looking at my work and sort of talking to people has been amazing because I, I wanted to create this dialogue between the, the crypto world and the art world because they're, they're sort of, they're very mutually suspicious, the sort of anarcho-capitalist um, massive on the crypto side and the um, the sort of so- socialist Aesthetes on on the art world side have fairly different worldviews, to put it mildly. But I do feel that um, you, you know that there's useful knowledge and and work and value that can be bought from each side, and that's what I was trying to do from the start. And seeing sort of very very serious curators and um, art theorists sort of no you know notice that there is something here and start getting engaged with it um, as soon as. We explain to them that it's not all about seventy million dollar um, image sales. That there's you know things slightly further down the long tail that they should probably pay attention to. That that's been amazing to start having those conversations. Yeah. So um, I want to discuss a little bit more about uh, kind of you know what the NFT art world looks like um, and and your perception of where it's going. But first, a quick word from the sponsors who make this show possible. With over 10 million users, Crypto.com is the easiest place to buy and sell over 90 cryptocurrencies. Download the Crypto.com app now and get $25 with the code LAURA. If you're a hodler, Crypto.com Earn pays industry-leading interest rates on over 30 coins, including Bitcoin, at up to 8.5% interest and up to 14% interest on your stable coins. When it's time to spend your crypto, nothing beats the Crypto.com Visa card, which pays you up to 8% back instantly and gives you 100% rebate for your Netflix, Spotify, and Amazon Prime subscriptions. There is no annual or monthly fees to worry about. Download the Crypto.com app and get $25 when using the code LAURA, L-A-U-R-A. The link is in the description. Ledger is the secure gateway to buy, exchange, and grow your crypto. What you need is a Ledger hardware wallet, which combined with the Ledger Live app, gives you access to all your favorite crypto services and dApps from one place. All that with some of the best security. No need to use different platforms to manage and secure your crypto. You have one place for all your crypto needs. Visit ledger.com and make your crypto journey easier and safer. Does your firm need rigorously vetted crypto market data that's aligned with the latest regulatory standards? Since 2017, Digital Asset Research has delivered high quality crypto data to institutional clients like FTSE Russell and Bloomberg. Digital Asset Research offers clean crypto asset prices and verifiable volume data that's calculated from highly vetted sources, crypto asset reference data, and an events calendar that tracks token and blockchain events like hard forks, soft forks, and client and application updates. Crypto data from Digital Asset Research is available through Refinitiv or directly at digitalassetresearch.com. Back to my conversation with Ria. So you kind of said before the, sh- before the ad break something, um, I forget the exact phrasing, but just something about how um, you felt like the, the NFT 
art world, I think, was maybe going in a different direction from what you originally expected, or, or I, I can't remember how you yeah. phrased it, but yeah. so we, what did you mean by that? And what do you make of what we've seen so far? So I, I absolutely love NFTs. I think they're great. Um, I, I think that artists being paid for art is a very good thing. And um, I, I have very little time for the, frankly, moral panic that we've seen from people who are determined not to think about NFTs. Sort of the, the, the energy usage gotcha that came up earlier in the year it was sort of based on terrible math, terrible attribution of terrible math and terrible thinking through of who benefits and who loses in this debate. Um, the party political broadcast ends here. Sorry about that. Um, so the thing that's interested me about the way the art world on chain has gone compared to what I was sketching out in 2014, I, I sort of viewed contracts as the obvious unit of production for art. Because I was thinking of net art, I was thinking of generative art, which has taken off recently and the on chain is great. And I was thinking, you know, this is brilliant. We can write these little programs that are smart contracts. We can make it so that they can manage their own exhibition and get exhibition fees for that. And um, you know, th this will be great. And um, it didn't turn out like that. And th I've thought a lot about sort of not so much where I went wrong, but where I went different. And it was that sort of inherited art world disdain for sort of artists directly having anything to do with money, which is a very interesting social and moral phenomenon that we don't need to dig into here. But whenever you encounter people getting upset that artists are making money, do just pause for a moment and think, hang on, who else are you upset gets paid for their work? What's, what's that all about? But anyway, um, so yeah, I, I, I thought, hey, this is great. People will make smart contracts and they'll be like self-exhibiting and then self agreeing to be included in books and they'll manage their own reproduction rights and that kind of thing and th this was very much because i was trying to avoid um, um commodification of things as money of trying to avoid financialization for art world's ideological reasons and this meant that sort of w when i was um doing a book launch for artists rethinking the blockchain at um, the hackerspace d control here in vancouver the people on before me were from this little startup called axiom zen talking about their crypto kitties project which everyone's very interested in but that i only knew had sort of you know congested the blockchain so i was totally on a different path at the time where nfts were becoming a formalized a formalized thing it took me ages to get my head around the punks it took me ages to get my head around um counterparty originally and um cynthia gayton and, and skrilla on um um, the old art and the blockchain podcast were instrumental in me getting my head around that. So, yeah, I, I was sort of looking in the wrong direction for ideological reasons. Um, NFTs came in, people started making really interesting things from out of the gate. Um, I, I'd love um, evolutionary art. I'm a big um, William Latham fan, who's, who's this artist who did sort of swirly nautilus shapes and computer graphics that were evolved, um, artificially evolved forms at the time when you needed like a room full of equipment to do that. And the, the kitties having little genomes on chain, I absolutely loved. Um, I didn't love everyone leaving after the, the kitties team talk when I was meant to be talking about my book, but some of the team stayed and but they were great. So, um, yeah, I, I was looking the wrong way. People did interesting things with NFTs. Um, I did start using NFTs where it made sense for a project. And then over time, you know, I just noticed the prices going up at the start of the year. We had the Beeple sale and everyone suddenly didn't know what NFTs were, didn't know what blockchain was, but they knew they didn't like it. And for me, the, the, the difficult thing about this was I'd, I'd noticed that lots of young sort of marginalized people who I followed on Twitter were suddenly getting their first art sales and they were getting money, which they wouldn't otherwise have, which was going on education, on rent, on food, on medical expenses, on, on medication. So there was, there was a good here. There was good being done here. And you, we can view this as like a tiny fraction of the $70 million NFT purchases, but there was still 
you know, a, a wider new entirely NFT art world native community here, which was benefiting financially from the fruits of their labor in a way which they otherwise wouldn't and in ways which were genuinely making their lives better. And sort of for those of you listening who aren't really into making people's lives better, they're also helping the economy move. So, you know, whichever <laughs> angle you're coming from, this was a good thing. And if I tried to mention this, it's like, oh, you know, they're, they're human shields. If I tried to mention that um, the energy usage of Bitcoin is, is interesting, but not a lot to do with Ethereum and certainly nothing to do with proof of stake based blockchains, people just genuinely didn't want to hear it. It was it was like telling them that there there are no fairies at the bottom of the garden. That it's just like total mental shutdown. Oh, and so, just out of curiosity, when you say because Ethereum does use proof of work, are you yes. saying that because they use GPUs rather than ASICs? Or so, I oh yeah, sorry. So um, I I live on on the planet Earth. I'm I'm a big fan of planet Earth. Um, ironic provocations I post to Twitter, notwithstanding. I, I think the Earth continuing and my kids being able to live on it is probably on balance a good thing. Bitcoin's energy usage is massive. Um, a lot of it comes from waste energy, from centrally planned energy production, which would otherwise you know, be, be created but not used. Some of it comes from renewables. Some of it comes from sort of waste hydrocarbons. So even within Bitcoin mining, the picture is more complex. Um, the, the argument that it's energy that could go to other things is kind of refuted by the fact that it doesn't. And the idea that it's wasted energy is refuted by the fact that it's being used to secure Bitcoin, um, which is a use, but also um, that, you know, this is not energy that has been created ex nihilo to do Bitcoin. And if we sort of bombed the capital of Bitcoin, it would stop using all this energy. That's just not how it works. However, it does use a lot of energy and it being more efficient would be and will be a good thing. Uh, Ethereum uses a lot less energy to do the same thing. Um, NFTs by artists use a tiny fraction of that energy, and if they stopped doing that, it would still run. They're sort of obviously a sort of an echo of the wider environmental crisis here, in that if I stop driving my gas guzzling car, then you know, so what? Everyone would need to, and that's a distraction from you know shipping container ships and the, the US military anyway. But yeah, you know, I, I, I'm aware that it's possible to make this kind of excuse for, for needed systemic change. But then um, Ethereum is going to proof of stake anyway. And there are existing proof of stake systems. Flow, which you may have heard of, is an excellent proof of stake system. And some of the other popular chains that artists are now on are proof of stake systems. And I've encountered people who simply refuse to believe that proof of stake uses less energy. It becomes an article of faith. So, yeah, to, 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 to unpack that, sort of, I, I look at this and I see a, a, a sort of, yes, alarming, but decreasing over time and to decrease more in the future use of energy. And so I'm sort of less worried about that and more worried about paying artists and developers and sort of everyone else who is doing interesting things in this area in the meantime. Um, but yeah, sort of watching the NFT art world emerge, watching the platforms emerge, watching artists sort of explore different aesthetics in there, watching different um, controversies emerge has been absolutely amazing. It's sort of, I, I was late to the net art scene. I didn't really, I wasn't really in that because I was sort of, busy with a young family and everything but um you know getting to watch this sort of new art world blossom from first principles has been absolutely amazing and i, I absolutely love nft art and sort of as someone who's written um very thorough sort of um critical art theory around the idea of um using blockchain to make art around the idea of tokenization. Um, there, there is something here. There is something art historically, art critically here. Um, it's very interesting to look at. And yeah, I, I just sort of, not uncritically, obviously, but um, qu quite separate from any other concerns. I'm just loving seeing what people are doing and getting paid for for the first time and getting critical interest for yeah. for the first time and the communities that are emerging. So I think it's great. 
Yeah, I was going to ask you because um, I don't know if you saw the Met Museum director basically um, kind of said he didn't really see anything that was worth um, the Met doing with NFTs. So that's that's weird because he should probably look in their collection in that case. But um, so I think that's stand at that like no, no disrespect to to the Met. Um, I, I don't know that particular person so this is a general comment rather than any kind of diss but um yeah that will get column inches that will get headlines that's a perfectly reasonable thing for someone from a long running art world institution to say um it's completely wrong it's completely completely wrong um we see some very interesting things happening in nft land Tell me how it is that you think NFTs are changing art. I'd be so interested to hear that. Totally, totally. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. So um, NFTs are uh, reinvigorating existing genres. Um, portraiture, which I mentioned earlier, there's some very interesting portrait work going on in NFTs. I know that they are portraits. But, and by of, that, you're talking uh, about like profile pics, like pengus and royal so, bo- so, ro- so, board apes. Yeah, and- yeah so P- PFPs are interesting. Um, Coldies. 3D things are really interesting. Um, uh, coin artists early paint just paintings which are tokenized of, of um, Vitalik and people, and artists like um, Josie who are doing sort of different, you know, pictures of people. And it's sort of the fact that you can get um, attention and revenue from doing this, and that you can play with it sort of technically and aesthetically means that this, this genre, which, if, you know, if you say to the average art critic, hey, there's a show of portraiture, they will roll your, their eyes at you and just regard it as the most outdated thing possible. We're seeing here the start of experimentation with, with you know, a, a genre as outdated as portraiture in a new and interesting way. Um, we are seeing imagery and kinds of art that otherwise are pretty much by definition unsaleable. I mentioned generative art earlier, which is sort of art created by little computer programs. You can download the source code for most generative art programs from GitHub. Now the artists can, you know, create things with that and and sort of get paid for that. And that gives them more time to work on it and more critical attention for it. Yeah, just sort of people talking about different experiences in 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 art. Um, I've seen sort of um african artists tokenize their art get revenue for that get critical attention transgender artists um many many different kinds of experience you know it are blossoming in 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 this new nft art world and even if we accept for a moment that there is nothing of interest there today for the for art world institutions which i find absolutely incredible and would would sort of raise both eyebrows at, um, the, the sort of the momentum that this technology has given to people means that there is work being done that wouldn't be otherwise, and it's going in directions that it wouldn't otherwise, and there, it, there, you know, there will be something here. It's like sort of the, the impressionists jumped on steam trains and, and the results are still hanging in, in museums sort of 100, 150 years later. So I th- yeah I think they are giving uh, new audiences um, with new capital, new access to new art, and within that it's enabling experimentation. I remember like back in the nineteen eighties reading one of William Gibson the cyberpunk author's uh, early books, and one of the characters in it um, works in a gallery in Europe selling art that is too expensive for anyone to own whole of the whole of so that they're just spending their day buying and shelling says shares of art to deal so this, this is fractionalized art and yes this is something that you can do with existing financial systems but um blockchain technology just makes art fractionalization incredibly easy um it makes um collaboration to sort of collect and curate and sell work. Again, people can already do this, but it, it makes it fantastically easy to set up a DAO, start buying crypto artwork, start sort of exhibiting it on different virtual and real platforms, and to create 
a new context for the arts. And it sort of, it meshes nicely with new currents in art, which are technologically based like AI art, like digital illustration art, like as I already mentioned, generative art, and it gives them it gives them sort of a re a, a, re a, re -anchor, a reality anchor in people's minds. It's like, you know, why should I pay you for this um, thing that you've spent your life learning how to make when I can just press a button and 20 come out? It's like, well, <laughs> I can establish the provenance of this one, that I, the person who spent my life learning how to make this, have attached to this NFT, you can't press a button and make 20 of those. So, yeah, I, it's... It's sort of um, yeah, it's 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 a, it's a world of possibility. It's and and people are making good on that possibility, um, even even sort of beyond the platforms that are making sure that people get paid for their art or sort of make art fractionalizable or um, you know so that you can set your artwork to day or night and make it configurable in interesting ways. And let's also talk about DAOs because I think those are intersecting with NFTs in an interesting way. There's been some curation DAOs. We obviously, when we did the people pleaser conversation, she talked about the pleaser DAO, which has sprang up spontaneously. So, what are what's your take on what's happening with DAOs, and um, how do you feel like that's changing art curation, or how will it change art curation? So, I, I think DAOs are great. I. I've followed them since um, the People's Republic of Doug on the Ethereum test net, which is a very early attempt of a DAO back, back when that yeah the, back when they were still called decentralized autonomous corporations. Um, I, I haven't read the books that everyone else has read that have sort of proto DAOs in them, so I had to come to them um, fresh and sort of like everyone, I, I watched the the DAO hack on. Ethereum chain with with horrified fascination. It was like a very slow motion, very low tech version of the hack at the end of Neuromancer. Whilst I'm mentioning William Gibson novels, I knew it would take DAOs some years to recover from that, and it has taken DAOs some years to recover from that. We've had some very good good experiments in the meantime. Um, not to single out any projects because I shouldn't, but there have been various sort of art commissioning ones which have been great. And um, the, the toolkits have built up. And I mentioned earlier that sort of, you know, you can get away with more with art and sort of art isn't, you know, food supplies to part of a country. It isn't national security. It isn't people's medication. Um, so if you get it wrong with something dealing in art, you will lose people money, you will harm people's reputations, people will be sad, but um, it's not as life or death, with apology to all of my artist friends, as other systems that you can see blockchain technology being applied to. So yeah, art, art DAOs um, are an, obvi I mean, an obvious way of doing things. I like um, artist groups, I mentioned art and language earlier. And I was desperate to see people use the blockchain for stuff other than immediate production of art. So, yeah, the, the, the emergence of um, collection curation DAOs like Pleaser DAO, like uh, Fingerprints DAO that bought some of my work, um, which is an interesting experience. Um, I, I, you know, I'm obviously um, implicated in some of this, so, you know, take anything... I say about it with a pinch of salt, but I'm yeah I'm excited by this. This is precisely what blockchain technology should do. It takes sort of human organisation, human coordination, um, and sort of makes it as easy to organise uh, and allocate capital to projects as. Um, like the, the metaphor I think I used before was, if you imagine it's the difference between having to set up like a movable type press from the the renaissance and sort of you know put every letter that you're going to print into a thing and then squeeze something down it's sort of that compared to the apache web server where you can spin up a, a linux instance on, on a cloud server somewhere spin up a web server write some code to configure it and you've got something published in you know 10 minutes with global reach with the ability to add um all sorts of things to it, and yeah, sort of um, uh, DAOs do this for for corporations, for charitable trusts, for partnerships, for LLCs, for all kinds of 
organization you can think of. And I've been watching the legal side of this very, very closely. Um, Primavera de Felipe and the co-author did a good book called Blockchain and the Law, which talks about this a bit, and the Koala Project, which I know she's a big player in, has just published their DAO model law, which uh, I am not a lawyer, and this is a purely personal capacity, but I think that's great. Um, I, I recognized a lot of the problems they were trying to tackle, and I thought they did it in a massively creative way. So I do think that sort of e- even if it's not enshrined in law in every jurisdiction that uh, every jurisdiction around the world i think it's worth dales looking at that to have a think through sort of how um fiat law may come knocking for them if they are not careful but mm. yeah so the, the ability of individuals to sort of get together pull their resources um sort of move democratically towards a shared common goal i, I think that's that's brilliant um but i was very interested in like blockchain co-ops early on and i think you know whilst obviously getting venture capital into um, curation um, DAOs isn't exactly like a co-op. The, the affordance is there, can be used for that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, it's funny you bring up Primavera de Filippi. She actually ran some workshops that I attended. I think it was in the first year that I started covering this. So like all the way back in 2015, if I remember correctly. Um, so I'll have to check that book out. Um, so just out of curiosity, and this is the last question, but where do you think the NFT space will go, um, you know, in the next year or so? And by that, I mean, even, you know, we can talk about DAOs or what you were talking about this, uh, you know, with the law or even, because I feel like we've talked a lot about visual art. So even if you have thoughts on other types of, um, you know, creators, that would also be interesting to hear. So, um, I'm. So my, my my deep dive has been in, in visual arts. Um, I I sort of I, I love um, the Holly Plus DAO because I'm I'm a big fan of um, sort of Vocaloid style music. Um, I, I like Hatsune Miku, and I'm a big fan. So I don't know this DAO, Holly Plus. Oh, sorry, it's Holly Plus. Like... So it's it's Holly Herndon from the uh, in, Independence podcast. So yeah, the um, she's sort of created a, a sort of you know an, an AI version of the, her voice and licenses through the DAO and I think that's a really interesting um, way of getting ahead of the use of that kind of technology to quote steal people's voice um, but beyond that I, yeah, I've, I've got my nose to the two-dimensional plane of, of art and I can't really go much further than that um, I'm, I'm very excited to see sort of um, uh, with apologies to all my free culture friends, I'm very excited to see sort of major IPs really leaping on to the blockchain. Um, obviously, the, um, sort of working at Dapper, um, sort of we've, we've got Top Shot and we've got other ones that are publicly known to be coming up. And some of those are ones I personally love. And it's sort of just, you know, the ability to get that connection to a brand because I'm, I'm not a big no logo fan unfortunately i think i think brands can be fun that's good um at the other at completely the other extreme um as i said seeing more and more people bringing in viewpoints that are simply excluded by by mass media and finding an audience in the place for that using nfts i'm I, you know i want to see that take off and continue and sort of people to be surprised by the art they like and what it means and sort of whose who's lunch they are paying for. And then um, I, I think sort of there are now so many NFTs out there, um, people are going to find more things to do, even with ones that aren't game tokens. Um, like that there have been various attempts at getting people to sort of bring their tokens together and, and um, use them for sort of game type things um we did one of those when i was at blockade and that was great fun but i think you know sort of people using punks and other um, portrait style images as their pfps is the first step towards sort of people getting more functionality more value more use from NFTs in ways that probably weren't originally intended for them. And we're going to see, um, you know, systems and projects and um, companies springing up to say, hey, you know, you should do more with your NFTs. Here are some fun things you can do. 
And um, as as someone who is hashtag not a lawyer, but sort of great, greatly enjoys reading law with the knowledge that there is no worse interpreter of legal text than a software developer, um, I've been very interested to see um, the NFT art world slowly rediscover copyright and um, how this works in art and how artists think of this versus how the mass media thinks of this. Because um, artistic, technological, and legal ideas of originality and copying are very different. And NFTs combine all three of these, which means there are very interesting tensions emerging. Uh, We had the, the art theft panic couple of years ago sort of the various punks clones um with people trying interesting legal theories to 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 justify and um so the whole question of you know what what do you get when you buy an nft it's certainly not the copyright which i know surprises many people who buy them but what is it and i'll be interested to see hopefully not case law because i don't want anyone getting sued over this but more clarity coming through over yeah you know what what does it mean to, to buy and sell an nft what rights do you get how does this interface with genuine fair use and and sort of um, appropriation and remix art in a way that we don't recreate the, the, the losses that um, what I personally view as cultural freedom has experienced over the last few decades as you've needed more and more and more permission uh, to get around more and more and more legal and technological impediments to sort of just depict the visual environment that you find yourself in. So, yeah, sort of I, I want the NFT art world to continue growing, to continue bring up, sort of bringing new um, people and new voices into it, um, to sort of realise some of the surplus value all of these NFTs have and to, if not, get its legal house in order. And to be clear, I'm perfectly happy with the terms of service I've signed on the different platforms I'm on and that kind of thing. But, um, you know, to sort of get some clarity for everyone so that we avoid any kind of big lawsuits over NFT art and we can just all get on sort of um, producing art, selling art, buying art and creatively transforming art to within the the, the limits of this shared consensus hallucination of sort of legal and artistic reality. Yeah. And if people are interested in the legal issues, I did do an episode with Tanya Evans, Stuart Levy, and um, Ulta and Doni on on all of this. And it was super, super, super fascinating. So I will put that in the show notes for people uh, because yeah, lots of misconceptions around that. Um, All right, Ria, this was so fun and exciting and interesting. I just love learning about your work. Um, So where can people learn more about you and your art? Yeah, I have a website at rea.art, that's R-H-E-A dot A-R-T. And if you go to rea.art slash newsletter, I'm starting up a good old-fashioned email newsletter so that people don't miss out on um, things that are happening with my art because to my surprise and delight, there are lots of things happening with it at the moment. And I'm, I'm on Twitter as Reaplex, R-H-E-A-P-L-E-X. And I do respond to questions as long as they're nice. <laughs> yes, I good policy. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on Unchained. Yeah, thank you. It's been brilliant. Thanks so much for joining us today. To learn more about Ria, check out the show notes for this episode. Unchained is produced by me, Laura Shin, with help from Anthony Yoon, Daniel Nuss, and Mark Murdoch. Thanks for listening. Thank you.